Corsair, our non-stimulant, thermogenic, and recomposition agent. Corsair is a super cool product because it's gonna help you utilize turning your white adipose tissue, which is for storage of fat, into brown adipose tissue, which is gonna help with energy production. So this is great to use for a competition prep or in your weight loss phase. So you can stack it with a, a stimulant-based thermogenic, or you could also use it in your off-season or muscle building phase to help keep you lean and mean. Corsair. <laughs> that's how it's gonna start jess is gonna explode and that's how the episode started <laughs> I, I really hope that like that was right before it actually because i said the f word emphatically and then it said recording in progress so i'm hoping that it came my timing was good i know i'll let you know <laughs> Welcome back to Hi guys. <laughs> Daffy Sasser Pro Physique Code situation <laughs> that we are experiencing. Episode. We're the party episode of the week. We are. We are. All right, guys. So we're gonna we're gonna piggyback off of the last one that Steven and I did. And we're gonna do some more questions from the Transformation Challenge group because there's a ton. And like Paul even had his um he had a live this last week and there was a lot that he couldn't get to in there. So I think there's a lot of good stuff that we can jump into that maybe we just don't think to cover all the time. Um, but we were chatting before we started recording and we wanted to jump straight into alcohol and transformation and how you add it in, don't add it in. Jess, what do you want to do this one? You were excited. <laughs> I was excited. I think Steven was actually the one who was excited. Even the one who was excited? Steven, yeah. go. I, oh my gosh. Oh my <laughs> gosh. You too. Make up your minds. Okay. I can't, I can't. This is why I day drink. All right. And this is exactly why. I day. <laughs> that's why alcohol. obviously why we were so excited to talk about it because I am wasted right now. <laughs> and he's within his macros, I bet. <laughs> I am not. I am not wasted. <laughs> so it comes from like, I think some of that old school IFYM stuff where it's like, cool, as long as it fits my macros, I'm good to go. I can do whatever the hell I want. And I'm like, I think about that in terms of like, well, as long as I don't get caught by the police, I can do whatever the hell I want. Like, right. yeah, technically you can, but that doesn't mean that it's the best thing. And it definitely doesn't mean that it's doing you good. Um, and I, I like think of alcohol in this, like, yeah, it, it might be permissible, but that doesn't mean it's beneficial kind right. of spot. And so when I see or hear people on a regular basis talking about, oh, yeah, I had you know this many glasses of wine this week, but it fit my macros, I just, I have a hard time because I'm like, there are so many other things that you could be spending those calories and macros on that would benefit you in so much more of a substantial way. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention, like, before we go off on a tangent about the fact that, hey, Cool. There are more, probably better ways to unwind and de-stress than drinking in general, anyways. And so maybe habit stuff could be beneficial. But like, it's just if you are trying to lock it down and do something to benefit your physique, drinking is literally the biggest waste of time and like one of the worst things you can do to make positive progress with your physique goals. Yeah, you said it. Like, I think that in this regard. If you ask any health and fitness coach, they're going to tell you it's the worst possible choice that you can make for yourself. Now, the does worst. That, <laughs> but like, does that mean that, for example, it was my birthday and we went out to a steakhouse, I'm going to have a glass of wine, but I'm not having alcohol on a weekly basis. I literally maybe drink once every, I don't know, six to eight weeks. And that's like, I have a drink. And for me, it's not to relax or to wind down. It's truly more of like a social experience with actually right. like legitimately my husband, right? Like, and that, and the, that's pretty much it. I'm not going to have a drink with anybody else just to have a drink. Like it is a way that my husband and I just connect. We enjoy a glass of wine together, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Also, when I have wine, I get a little bit funner. So those types of things. 
what? I'm I'm generally fun. But like I, anyways. Christina <laughs> I'm knows fun, what I'm, damn it. Christina knows what I'm talking about. But like this is not a way that I manage my stress. And I'm also not in a phase where I'm in a comp prep or a fat loss phase. I am very much in like a building situation. And I know in my brain, I'm not going to go train the next day because my sleep's probably going to be not as great. Right. And I just make sure to drink a bunch of, wick, um, I almost said alcohol, drink a bunch of <laughs> water Slam. before and after. I know. So it's, mm. it's truly, and I've really changed my tune on this because I used to drink more often Steven's like mm -hmm. because I did because Steven was my coach for five years and like in an off season I would drink a little bit more and I simply didn't make the same progress and my physique did not look the way that it looks now so I don't know if anybody's watching on YouTube we're doing the turkey head that's what, what I, I also do. like drinking with your husband I think it's one way. of those things where like with what you mentioned, like date nights and stuff, I always try to protect it in those situations. If it's important to somebody, I know like Vic likes to go order like a bottle of like, we'll split a bottle of wine. That's like super nice and like things like that. And so it's a part of our like date night routine. Um, I think when it, like what Steven brought up is when it's a part of like the wind down routine every night. And especially like it, correlates so often with somebody who is also, you know, trying to stick to like 12 to 1400 calories per day, but then they're spending somewhere around three to 600 per night on alcohol, whether or not that's counted in the four, like 12 to 1400 that they're trying to stick to. And so either way, we're in trouble because in, on one hand, we're spending a significant amount of our daily calories towards alcohol, even if we're, you know, having it on top of our calories. On the other one, if you're logging that, <clears throat> then that would be like half of your daily calories or your daily carb intake coming from alcohol instead of actual food. And then saying we have goals of building muscle or losing body fat. And the thing is your body just wants it out. And so it's not going to focus on anything else until it achieves that goal. And so if we're getting little bits every day, like we're never hitting our full potential when we walk into any situation. And like, that's where- God, you sound like my mom. Break it up. Well, and <laughs> when, hey, I'm one where like come summer, you will catch me having drinks routinely. Like that's my time. There's like a two month period towards the end of summer where like I like to have cocktails then. And then like the rest of the year, it's just not a thing like I'm going to deal with. It's definitely not something while I'm like running this much and that often I couldn't risk like what would happen to my heart rate because it just goes through the roof and I would 100% feel like I was dying. Oh, I meant when you say like something about being disappointed, but yeah, that I'm not living up to my potential. Thanks, mom. <laughs> uh, I'm the good kid. I swear. I'm, I'm, I'm the good one. Know. Uh, you know, man, it's just... I feel like it's one of those things because it's such a big part of social life as a, adults and depending where you live in the world, maybe even a teenager that we get into the, and it's the same thing with food, right? It's different social environments, different food choices, normalized. Um, and so that if you don't do that stuff, oftentimes you almost feel like there's something wrong with you or you're made to feel like there's something wrong with you. But the truth of the matter is, and, and you know, they used to say, okay, cool, yeah, this much wine or you know, this many beers a week is actually good for your health. But that's been debunked and shown to been have been incorrect. Uh, so, you know, realistically, it's this thing that where it really doesn't have a benefit for your health. It definitely doesn't have a benefit for your fitness goals. <clears throat> but because it's there are still those misconceptions because they were around for a long time and that stuff doesn't just go away. Uh, and because it's it's the, the socially acceptable drug, right? I mean, like, depending where you live, like, weed might be socially acceptable as a drug, you know, for people to kind of chill out and use for those things. But it, it is the just over time, historically socially acceptable. We can't smoke opium in the dens anymore, but we can still, you know, get a nice bottle of whiskey or scotch and get, get after it. Um, so it just, 
it gives people that easy outlet to feel a little bit better without maybe necessarily taking care of those things in a way that's going to be more beneficial. Yeah. And I think like you, when, when you're making the choice to drink or not to drink, you want to ask yourself, how does it serve you? Like, I, I think like Stephen, like you were saying, you, you're making a, a choice and how does it benefit you? Right. And, um, like truly ask yourself that. Cause then I'll have clients that'll be like, Oh, I'm just going to not drink ever. Or they'll, or they'll like choose to um, have like dry January or whatever. And that's totally fine. I think that having that choice within whatever that aspect is, is, is fine. And that's good. As long as you're not doing it in like a forceful extreme kind of way and thinking that that's, that's what we want to hear. Whereas, you know, actually I had a client tell me about that they were going to do dry January and I had to have like a serious conversation with them about like, is this realistic and like helpful for you? Or are you just going to go and binge in February? Right. And so it's really asking, it's really asking yourself, how does this choice serve you now and in the future? And sometimes it requires having conversations with other people because Stephen, you're right. It's a socially acceptable drug. I remember when I started drinking less and less, I, the majority of my friends in Canada are not like they work out sometimes, but they don't do health and fitness stuff. Like that's not their jam. And that's totally cool. Um, whatever. But they were like, why are you not drinking? Like I would get asked this all of the time, all of the time. And every time I was like, this is the same. I, I'm just making a choice for me. No, thanks. Um, but why? Why, why are why you didn't choosing? You, you got to use the accent. Hey, why aren't you drinking? I, that's not right. That's not Wait, right that's one. definitely <laughs> not Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Go to, I, I don't know. Can I do Canadian accent? I don't know. But I would get asked. And so I would have to have these conversations. And now it's just a thing that just like Jess doesn't drink. Right. And they all do. Um, and I just don't. And some of them have started to kind of like change the way that they look at alcohol and behave around alcohol and, and adjust their choices. But it does require having a conversation with people because they've seen you engage in alcohol for a long time um, or consistently. And so, you know, just be aware that if you're making that choice to not drink or drink less, you will be asked why. And it's simply because people are going to see you doing something different. It's just like when you start your health and fitness, like, oh, why are you counting macros? They're not doing it from a place of like malice. They're probably just doing it from a place of maybe curiosity, maybe because it's a different behavior. Maybe it's an insecurity of their own, right? So maybe it is out of malice. <laughs> maybe it is out of malice and fuck those people. Yeah, well, then that's <laughs> crazy, right? We can just ignore them. But that other piece you said where maybe it's more on them is like what I feel like clients end up finding over time. A lot of the times that they get shit from somebody about stuff is that, you know, if you stick with it, then like three months later, when they see that you've really leaned into this and this is a change that you're making and you're prioritizing, you know, new things in life, then they start having questions where they're like, so, so what is it you're doing again? And like things like that, all of a sudden they want to know what's up. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's dive into... Oh my God, guys, it reset. No, it didn't. Okay. I found it. I just had a hard time. <laughs> the questions went away. Oh, I was going to be Panic. So sad. Yes. I'm going to start just screenshotting a whole bunch of stuff. Um, okay. So we kind of touched on this a little bit, so I don't know how much more we would need to dive in, but, um, the best advice for sleep and to decrease cortisol levels. So don't drink for sure. <laughs> if that's like a big focus, that's a really easy low hanging mm -hmm. fruit where I think people turn towards a cocktail thinking, oh, well, it's going to help me relax. And then I'll be able to lay down and go to sleep, but it absolutely trashes it. Like it's not good quality sleep and you're going to wake up feeling terrible, even if you sleep for a long time. Now I have a question. Are we talking about cortisol levels overall or lowering cortisol, like, cause cortisol is a curb, right? So I'm right. assuming that it's lowering cortisol and stress and chilling out around bedtime for sleep. 
Well, I think also when we talk about like lowering cortisol, we mean overall, right? So it's yeah. not like, yeah, your cortisol should be coming up a little bit during the morning hours and it should be kind of decreasing throughout the day and into nighttime. And that's normal circadian rhythm. So whatever morning and nighttime is for you. But for those of you out there, when we talk about like cortisol stress stuff, it means like if it's chronically high, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, or even in, it can be a problem like if it's high at the wrong times. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh man, I have this really, I don't know, some people, I guess, do a good job being high. But like, if I went into a really big presentation, high, just blown out of my mind, like that would be the wrong time to be high. I need to be high at a different time. You know, that's when that's beneficial. Relating cortisol to getting high. Yes. I love it. I didn't take that, my meds And that's, today, that's why I asked. Cause I was like, are we talking about like cortisol in general? Cause yeah. being stressed and being chronically stressed, that's a thing we need to like, be aware of like, if you're feeling tired, but wired at night, right? Like that's not a feeling that you should be getting or waking up at 3 a.m. and being really wired at 3 a.m., 3, 4, 5 a.m. That those can be indicators that your cortisol is either elevated or you have an inverse spike or an inverse curve, sorry, that your cortisol is like higher at bedtime which obviously we don't want. Don't die. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still recovering from my, whatever the heck I had. Um, for me, and I mean, there's, there's so many things that we could talk about in terms of like overall stress and stress management. Um, I, I find if you're in a fat loss phase, you're already going to be susceptible to stressors on your body because you're eating less, which is a stressor, and you're probably doing more cardio, which is a stressor. So just looking at your overall like output and asking yourself, is that reasonable for me right now? Right. Cause I feel like sometimes we are very easily, we want to like do all of the things and go all into the extremes. So taking a look at that, like, do we need to be extreme? Do we need to be hitting 25,000 steps a day? Um, you know, and doing all the cardio and eating less food. Um, so kind of looking at your overall output and your overall stimulus load in general. Um, same with like in your work, are you able to create distance from your work and your just normal life, right? Um, do you have boundaries in place? Do you have boundaries with other people in your life um, that maybe <laughs> cause stressors um, like relationships with other people, um, work relationships, those types of things. And just being starting like that awareness, I think umbrella, um, and looking at your overall stressors and then asking yourself, are there places that you can maybe make tweaks, pull back a little bit, um, reduce that overall load. That's like a super general answer. <laughs> so I, th I think a couple of things are important to understand. And first and foremost is that no stress is also a negative impactor just as much as to stress. Mm -hmm. um, if we have no stress, we also, we don't change, we don't get better. So the goal should never be to have no stress in our yeah. lives. That's, that's, that's a weird thing and it doesn't exist. The goal should be that our stress is within manageable levels. Um, but in terms of, I think, easy take home things to improve sleep quality. Yeah, sure. Stress management, do a meditation before bed, yeah. but also don't do high intensity exercise within a few hours of bedtime. Uh, cut your caffeine intake off early enough. Uh, manage bright light exposure as you get close to bedtime. Um, have a specific nighttime routine that you use every single night as you get into bed so that you're preparing yourself mentally and physically for sleepy time. You know, those kinds of things. Um, shit. I, I say this even though the dogs are on me every friggin' night in bed. Don't put, don't let the dogs in bed. Literally, it messes up my sleep all the time. They're all on my legs and everything. And then I'm sweating and it's gross and it's uncomfortable. Just don't let the dogs in the bed, maybe, you know? Um, so I think there's some easy take-home things there um, that can help improve. For some people, if you eat too close to bedtime, that will impact your ability to, like, get more restful sleep. And that can definitely be a thing, too. Uh, but if you don't have those things kind of locked off, Maybe start there. Maybe like start on the, as we call it, the low hanging fruit, right? 
Oh, that's what that was. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think that was? That's low hanging fruit. You, you, you pick the fruit that's hanging low. Yeah. Give it the wiggly fingers and you go. Bloop. The wiggly fingers. I don't know that that's an effective way to pick a fruit though. Look, I, I'm going to be real with y'all. I'm, I, I have not been on my meds this week because they're out. So there is a national shortage of ADHD meds. And if you can't tell, obviously I'm off my rocker a little bit today. Are you going to have them for command the stage? So I had to, here's the other fun thing about ADHD meds is they're all a controlled substance because they're essentially amphetamines. So I can't, if say this pharmacy is out, I can't just have them call it to another pharmacy. I have to go send a message or call my doctor, have my doctor take that one out and then send it to another pharmacy. So I did finally find a pharmacy, but they only have the non-generic. They don't have the brand name. So instead of like $15, it's like $370. Yeah. But yes, I'm going to have my meds. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, because we're in for a wild oh, ride. I was so excited to hear how it was going to go. I was like, we should podcast some more. Like we should capitalize. <laughs> so can you like, it's also important to understand I've only been Medicaid for what, two, maybe three years, really? All the rest of Pro Physique was this nonsense. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> Oof. I love it. Okay. Oh, let's patience. see. Um, how it has to be estimate. It says estimate. So how to estimate macros when you have an event or go out and bring your food and bringing your food is not an option. Sorry. They typed that weird. What if it is stimate? What if it, we just don't understand? What if that's like a new word? And then I don't like sus. And or cap. like yeet. You I know? still really know what cat means. Just like. It's no cat for real, for real dog. Is it, does that mean like, I'm not lying? I don't know what it means. I literally follow a TikTok of this woman who is like in her mid to late thirties and she has a child in like early junior high. So like grade seven or eight. And she like sits in her minivan and like talks about Gen X language and like things. Anyways, whatever. I think it's hilarious. Um, how to estimate macros? Well, it depends on where you're going. If you know where you're going ahead of time and you're going to a restaurant that has its macros online, is it accurate? Absolutely not. But at least it's something, right? So look it up online. Um, that would be like the easiest thing or where to start or look at the menu. If you know where you're going, look at the menu ahead of time and pick something similar within your app. Like maybe it has like fish tacos, like whatever. And I know, I know of like the Canadian restaurants that have fish tacos on their menu and like what's in them. Um, but you guys don't have like original Joe's in America. I feel like, um, I think that you have Joey's, but anyways, um, look up something similar, right? right? So you can look up something similar, but I feel like Chili's has stuff online. I don't know a lot of American. That's where you can find like the general, if you type in what the menu item is for the most part, you should be able to find somewhere and it'll give you like a estimation. I feel like with this question, it almost seems more like they're saying, how would you estimate it when you have an event and bringing your food is not an option? So it makes me think maybe it's like something a wedding, like, like a wedding or maybe like a work conference where they're providing lunch or something like that. And in those situations, I usually, so we're not going to know, right? Like yeah. we don't have a menu. Maybe we're not, like, we're just walking in blind. And so I'll, if we know this is going to happen ahead of time, I'll recommend having like a protein and produce heavy breakfast. And so, you know, if we can do something along the lines of like Greek yogurt and berries and like maybe some nut butter or something like that, where it's just going to be like a big breakfast, that's going to not like check a whole bunch of boxes and then kind of think the same way, maybe if we're having to do that for lunch and the event is at night. And that way we're not going into it starving because it used to be the thing like, oh, it is hard your macros. Just don't eat all day and then show up. And then you go fucking ham in the first like 15 minutes that you're present at a buffet. Can you imagine? And just like 
you're going to go crazy because you're so hungry. You could probably eat your full day of macros within that first like 15 minutes while you're snacking, like before you have figured out what you're having for dinner and have sat down. And so don't go into it super hungry. I like to tell my clients if they're going to have like an untracked meal where we're estimating, try to hit 50% of your fats and your carbs throughout the day and 75% of their protein. And then that way they've hit most of their protein goal. They're not going into it hungry, but we saved up a good chunk of our day. And then they can just go enjoy themselves and not have to worry about trying to hit numbers. I think both solid pieces. What my mind goes to immediately with this is the idea that we, yeah, you you want to be close, but you're not going to be perfect. And you have to come to terms with that. Like you're not going to know exactly how much oil they use to make it or the exact serving of mayo that's on the sandwiches and stuff. And that has to be okay. Um, you have to learn to be okay with the fact that you don't have complete control over every one of those situations. Right. And that within that, your job is simply to make the best decisions within that situation that are possible. Not being perfect, not hitting your macros to a zero or any of that kind of stuff. Um, not it, it's okay. So maybe the choices aren't great. So you have to really focus on like portion control. Okay. Maybe, maybe they're super friendly and you don't have to be as aware of portion control. I, but figuring out, okay, there, there is going to be some leeway there and you have to learn to be comfortable and not having like 100% concrete knowledge of that and saying, I, I know it's not perfect, but I know how to try and make it good enough because as good as you can do is always going to have to be good enough. Yeah. Like, Cause you can't do better. That's it. Yeah. Like the other part of that is um, not letting something like that trip you up to the point that you're just like, fuck it. And then go ham because I feel like that gets a lot of people too. And I've actually had a couple check-ins this week, like with guided coaching where something happened, like in that first week, I had one person break her toe. Um, I forget what the other one was, but there's been like a bunch of stuff where it's just like really thrown off what the plan was. And they were like, you know, if I didn't have something like this going on, this 100% would have been the thing where I was like, mm, better luck next month. And like, waited and it's like no this is always going to happen like this isn't going to be the only hopefully it's the only broken toe but like something of that caliber will probably happen again within the next 90 days and this is where we build up that resiliency and the capability to get through events where we have no clue but we don't want to starve the whole time and like we want to have something then you just build up confidence by going into it saying like I'm going to approach this with my goals in mind and not go crazy. And that's like, people have the capability to do that more than they think, you know, like a lot. Oh no, I don't have the willpower to do that. If there's a dessert table, I'm gonna go crazy. You know, you hear all the things and it's like, no, you can, you can have like one bite and share it with somebody if you want and try some things and like drink your water the whole time. You totally can. And then have dinner afterwards. And you just have to do it once. And then it's like, oh shit, it's not that bad. And then you're fine. You're never going to be able to do it if you continue to tell yourself you're unable to do it for sure. That's right. totally what I was going to say. I was like, if you've already said that, you've already shot shot yourself in the foot. You've already. But you're gonna. It. You're gonna. It's gonna go wrong. Yeah. By yeah. the way, Christina, can can you uh, educate me? What does you keep saying going ham? What does that mean? <laughs> I so I feel like there's <laughs> probably more to saying that than I'm giving it. But like, <laughs> do you not say that? <laughs> No, I mean, it, it's an acronym, right? What is what is it an acronym for? <gasps> Eat all of the things. Fuck it mode. It, it means hard as a mother. Oh, does, it, really? does it really? Yes. I thought it just like meant ham. Like, no, we, it, I don't know. If you're going like, ham, you're going hard as an mf -er. <gasps> Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love it even more now. Is I also looked up no cap. Oh, oh. Well, I'm so glad. Are you on Urban Dictionary? Of course. Um, so... It Fabulous. came from them talking about a reference apparently to decorative gold teeth and having like actual gold teeth versus like the plated caps. And so if it was no cap, it meant it was real, it was more authentic. So no cap apparently is, uh, you're authentic, authentic, right? I'm being honest for real dog. 
no cap for real for real and a half year old from the suburbs of the denver metro is running around talking about like no cap about like no these are real teeth (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) i love it i love it that lesson he says sus all the time that that's the one that i'm like oh i know that yeah that's sus i mean they're gonna accept it or it's going to bug me. I'm like right at the edge of going one way or the other where I start saying it. Mm. The the problem is when you start to like say it to make fun of people and then it like unintentionally just becomes a part of your personality. Right. What about right. Blue? Huh? Blue? Delulu. 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 I, Cora says that all the time and she's got a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm like, you're eight. Why do you talk like you're cool or something? Like She is cool. Oh, we we were going to do questions and answers, but Urban Dictionary. <laughs> we're talking about, enough. hey, <laughs> uh, you typed in a question and we received answers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. Um, okay. Nutrient timing. Does it matter? Oh. A lot? Depends. Uh, about uh, right here. Okay. It only matters if you're actually hitting your goals in the first place. If you're not hitting your goals in the first place, then you do not need to be thinking about nutrient timing whatsoever. Yeah. Start hitting your goals first and foremost. I have a yeah, little- I always, um, I was, oh, I was going to say Eric Helms' period, P- period. <laughs> wow. Um, Is that where pyramid. I came from? I don't We're know learning- where I got my pyramid from, but it has- We like are learning new things about Eric every day. <laughs> so at the bottom is adherence yeah. and behaviors. And that's like, can you adhere? And then it's like, it steps up from there. And macronutrient timing is just under, I feel like, which is the tip of the pyramid, which is supplements. Right. Yeah. So I have one that's similar, but the base of mine is just calories being consistent daily. And then the next one is like macros and then it goes into micronutrients and then timing and stuff. And so I put it in my plans to show that like, I don't want to stress you out with this information about nutrient timing and things. I want you to start here, be consistent at the base. And then as we're ready to like add in new levels, we can get more consistent with stuff, but it's got the supplements and the meal timing at the top. I know my, the only things I really talk to clients about are protein spread throughout the day. So it's not really meal timing, but more like meal division, you know, (laughs) What, how do you break it down, Stephen, for the protein timing? No, no, I mean, it, it's still meal timing, but the only one I actually really, truly care about is, yes, the protein timing. So that we're getting enough protein, and yes, there's enough time in between meals to account for, essentially, it's what we call the refractory period of protein theory, that you need enough time to, like, reload your ability to trigger muscle growth with your nutrition. Right. But- the research is pretty damn split between whether or not carbohydrate timing around your workouts actually matters. So likely uh, it, it's an individually dependent thing. So if you say it to everybody, well, it probably actually doesn't matter for everybody. And then again, if you go back to, I'm trying so hard to like do my meal timings that I F it up and now I'm overeating or under eating or way off of where my numbers should be, um, then it, it's a moot point anyways. Right. Yeah. Totally. Um, I agree. I I definitely feel like that's one of those things. And all the time, people miss the forest for the trees when it comes to like health and fitness and stuff and their nutrition and their their goals. But you're putting the cart before the horse on that. If Now, if you're there, then yes, you're a more advanced person and you're, you're hitting your numbers on a normal daily basis. Those things are good. Cool. Now, maybe it might make sense to look at nutrient timing, but we got to get there first. Yeah. At that point, I just tell people for the, like, I'll break it down person by person if their timing for the day is weird, but to aim for roughly like 25% of their day pre and post. Do you have a way you, no, I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah. Mine's 25 to 30% of your total, total carbohydrate intake pre and post. But again, that depends because do you train at 4 a.m.? Right. Exactly. And then, and then my only thing is if you want to make the best progress, you need to eat something prior to you training. May it be a banana or a protein shake. And then I also do recommend water 
like 20 ounces pre 20 ounces intra um and then obviously water after I also recommend having some sort of electrolytes so either like literally putting salt in your water or having a core hydrate with your intro workout having BCAAs um and possibly even some carbs intro workout if you are training first thing in the morning but again like whatever works for that client is going to be what's best. So like, can you get a banana in? Or maybe you don't like that. Maybe you want a protein shake. So like macronutrients don't necessarily in that, like for me matter as much as just getting something in, getting hydration in, getting electrolytes in, if need to be, have some fruit juice or a Gatorade intra-workout um, and then have like a good quality meal post-workout that includes a good amount of protein carbs, fats, just like good nutrient dense meal, but then yeah. And so also keep in mind, like where you're at matters. If you're at the end of a hard diet and you're trying to put all of your calories first thing in the morning, cause you work out early, you're going to be hungry as shit all day. Yeah. That might be the wrong decision because again, that comes after hitting your, your total numbers. Um, so some people yeah, you're going to do better with not trying to force food extra early because you're doing that stuff. Because if you do that, you're going to have the inability to hit numbers. Right. So or again, remember that stuff comes after the fact. So if you're building and you have more food, it's going to be much easier to facilitate things like, you know, full calorie Gatorades or intra workout carbs and that kind of stuff. If yeah. you're dieting and calories are lower, it is not going to be quite as easy and it may not be worth the squeeze to try and force that for you. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a lot. Like, I do that with the reverse diets too, especially if I have somebody who's a bit nervous about where carbs are going, where I'll tell them like, we're going to add in 10 carbs this week. And I want it to go straight to your pre-workout meal and it have it be something super digestible and start making it a bit easier to like add that kind of stuff in when we have the room to. And then, I mean, when calories get really low, I know like I usually end up timing it more so for the pre-workout meal to get through the workout. You know, like I remember in prep, like I, I would have to have a snack before going into a lot of my stuff. But if calories are low enough where you can't have, like, you don't want to put your full 25%. I like the protein shake idea for a, a people too. And then sometimes adding in like Nesquik, that's like super easy carbs that you can add to a chocolate protein shake and not have it be like a crazy amount where you're committing to like 30 grams or something. You can add a tiny bit. And that's really nice in the morning when people don't want too much in their, um, stomachs while they're training, but it hits the bloodstream pretty quickly. So that's always nice. Okay. Let's see. We got time for one more. Um, what is the best way to handle exercises within a five day full body split when you're still sore from your previous workout? Stay home. What? Just don't force the extra workout. If you're oh, still yeah, sore, I was going to say, don't yeah. work out. Yeah. Right. And what is best, like, quote, unquote, quote, unquote, like, that is best, obviously. Other other than my last name, <laughs> other than me. Um, Like, that requires sometimes a black or white answer, but health and fitness isn't black or white. So, like, even though we're giving a black or white answer, like, just don't work out. Right. In this case, I'm I would be siding on just don't work out, have an extra rest day. But it's very, very client dependent. Cause I don't know. I don't know who's asking. I don't know if it would be best. Um, would it probably be best? Probably. Well, that's where like <laughs> so like but, with the challenge, I put five day workouts in there because a lot of people love five day plans. But I've told everyone that'll ask me do four <laughs> like all, all of my guided coaching clients I said don't do don't do five do yeah four. I was take three. out day four and then take out day two if you're going to go down to like three days per week I, like that way you can make it work and that was like this way we're hitting something throughout the week even if you have to tailor it down to like meet your needs with that stuff but my recommendation is with everybody has been either take the rest day like don't force five days in a row because it's a lot to try and recover from and it's not going to be super ideal because one way or another, 
you're probably a bit fatigued. If you had a really fantastic workout on Monday, you're probably carrying some portion of that like into Wednesday even. And so if you can fit, if you do four days and you can do like a midweek rest day and then have um, like not have your weekends off too, it sets you up really well. Um, I've been recommending body weight too for some, like if we just want to get like some movement and like we're too sore with things, then light walking always is going to help. And then, um, some body weight movement maybe. And then we probably need to take another look at the weights we're using in our workout. If you're dying after every single one, then we're exceeding maximum recoverable volume. And we need to probably look at the weight that we're using to get to a place where we don't feel like we're dying all the time. Yeah. And so I would say uh, probably 98% of the time, I would say, yeah, just take the, take the day off, rest, recover. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with five days a week. Now, if you've only been working out one or two days a week, there's something wrong with five days a week, right? It, it's, it's how you progress that stuff. So you don't want to go from zero to 60. You want to go from zero to five to 10 to 15 to 20. Um, so if you haven't been working out at all, yeah, maybe two or three days a week. Most, at most, that's going to be fine. Um, is it okay to be extra sore as you start something new? Sure, but at probably a week or two at most, right? If yeah. you're still sore three weeks in and just wrecking it and can't walk out of the gym and can't drive home, like that's a problem. Um, you're better off. Like, I think what gets lost is everybody's like, I'm going to do all the work to build the muscle or I'm going to do the work. I'm going to build the muscle. Um so that's Steamboat Mickey because he's no longer copyrighted. Um, so ADHD, man. Uh, <laughs> but you're, when you're going to the gym, you are giving your body the kind of like, okay, you're giving it the stimulus to build muscle. The actual muscle building is done elsewhere. It's done at home and while you sleep and throughout the rest of the week, um, normally next two days based on what you did and how much, right? Um, so up to 48 hours. So if you're not actually, your job going to the gym is just to trigger the muscle growth, then allow it to happen throughout the rest of the week. But if you're continuing to try and trigger the muscle growth, you're getting diminishing returns anyways. So you're not triggering as much by doing extra stuff. All that extra volume, that extra work, you, you could just be throwing it right in the trash, you know? Um, so it, it might not really be doing you as much good. For most people, it's probably better to focus on making sure you're getting adequate recovery than trying to do extra external work, um, especially if you are having those signs that you're not getting adequate recovery. Yeah. Yep. Um, let's see, what are we at? Just like right about an hour. Should we do one more or call it? Yeah, let's do one more. Give us a good one. Done, done, done. Okay, pressure. Um no, I don't like that one. Do another one. So I, the other ones we had are like super, super specific. And like one of them would be more, it's like a question for a physical therapist about like golfer's elbow. Um, mm. Now, but that's- golf. A, Problem solved. I wish. So I got golfer's elbow. I don't, I, like I don't golf unless I, you know, we go on one trip a year. Um, and the, I like Vix had it for years. It's the absolute worst thing in the world. Like, well, it's not the worst thing, but it's, it's it different than tennis elbow or is it the same thing? It might be. I don't know. He said it was golfer's elbow and he was like, oh, does it hurt here? And he grabbed my elbow and I like collapsed to the floor. I was like, yes, it's so bad. And it's the weirdest thing, but forearm work, um, helps a lot with that kind of stuff. But those are questions that you don't necessarily want to be asking just like personal trainers and like coaches and stuff, but like, you probably want to go see somebody in person and have them test for that uh to make sure you're doing the right stuff and also to look at form that's a great like reason to be looking at how you're doing your exercises and stuff because maybe you're inadvertently causing your own problems um fun fact I golf was elbow interior it's on the inside tennis elbows on the outside so that's mine was right in here like right where the before the fold oh. oh. you got that golfy bow it's so bad. I don't recommend. Don't get it. Um, okay. I feel like we should stop at those and I'll collect some from Paul's next time. <laughs> so we have a really good list. I'll, I'll take my meds next time. 
I mean, I don't know. This was joyful. It Last reminded time. you of the good old days, didn't it? It really did. It, it did. Thank you. Maybe mm. just on Wednesdays, you could skip it. And then that'll help stretch out the $375 prescription. <laughs> I try not to take them on the, on the weekends when I'm not doing check-ins and stuff. But if I have to be in front of the computer, it's very helpful. Yeah. We used to do that with our son too, where on the weekends, we wouldn't have him on it. But our, the same thing happened to us where the for us to get the name brand, it was going to be like $780 a month. I was like, ew, I don't like that. Yeah. Mm. It's gross. If only, if only there weren't a shortage. What? Like the shortage has been going on for like two years. Yeah, I was, it, it's manufacturers blame the FDA or, or uh, whatever government agency. The government agency blames the manufacturers, yada, yada, yada. Um, either way, there's just not enough for the amount of drugs that uh, physicians are prescribing. Yeah, it's crazy. So, well. Now we'll know if you're different next week, but I think you're going to bring the energy anyways. <laughs> yeah. I didn't feel like I brought it today. No, you totally did. You're worried too much. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you're ADHD. Right. Right. You're thinking too much. All right. We will talk to you guys next week. Thanks for hanging out with us. Have a good one. Bye.